my name is Konstantin Osipov. I'm from Moscow. I do Toronto. Toronto is in a memory database and application server. And uh, we added a complementary storage engine for our memory technology for cold store. It's called Vinyl. And uh, this talk is about why we didn't choose RocksDB, or actually, uh, it's uh, uh, it's not. It's just a catchy title. So, but it's going to be interesting to whoever is, okay, clicker, uh, clicker, uh -huh. to whoever is uh, uh, interested in in uh, log structured merge trees as a technology, uh, and uh, wh obviously to our users of. I don't think I see any Toronto users in this room, not yet. Uh, so, and uh, uh, why we didn't choose Rocks the Beast? Like, let me start with the question right now. But no, before I start, if you are at all interested in Toronto, just uh, go to our website, toronto.org, uh, try it now. And it's really easy to try, it's online. You can type queries and see stuff. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the structure of this talk is here. It's a review of log structure data stru log structure merge tree as a data structure. Who actually needs a review of this in this room? Because I know that these guys don't. So whoever needs a review of log structure merge tree says raise your, your raise your hand. So nobody, mostly nobody. Uh, Okay, so then we're just gonna skip this part, and uh, 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 vinyl architecture. Uh, what is different from RocksDB? Uh, then, uh, yeah. So I'm going to talk about like problems and how we solve the problem. So it's actually this talk is uh, on, on a less advanced level than some of the necessary that some for RocksDB engineers. But let's see what we can do. So to Tackle the difficult question first. I'll just use this. To tackle the difficult question first, why didn't we choose RocksDB in the first place? And uh, there is not only RocksDB on the market, there is ForestDB, there is Wired Tiger. There are many libraries you, we could use, and uh, we didn't decide, we decided not to use any of them, so we decided to do something from scratch. And the nice answer that would be solve it all is that because we are from Russia, and we are the builders and not buyers by nature. But that's a simple, funny answer. And now I'm going to give you a bunch of technical reasons. And to understand these reasons, you need to look at the, this picture, which, which is the architecture of our database. So this is not an embedded database. Like, it's not SQLite. It's a standalone server. And we're actually saying that we are a grid compute application. It's an in-memory database. And these lines. Think about them as like borderlines, is like threads. So we have a unique architecture, which is called a, which is actor-based architecture, in which all queries are handled by a single thread. So it's, you could think about us as like Node.js of databases, or or like Nginx of databases. Uh, so uh, this is the, the guy. This is the thread which is handles all queries. So to make sure that we can get as much performance as possible, squeeze as much as possible out of this thread, every bit of auxiliary work is in, in, in separate threads. So the, uh, the idea of Toronto is that there is a network thread, there is a transaction thread, and there is a write-ahead log thread. And then they exchange messages in actor-based architecture to do the work. So whenever a request is arri arrives from the network, it first enters the IO thread, gets parsed here, validated, routed to, to a shard if necessary. To, if it's a shard, it's set up. Then it enters the transaction processor. And uh, in Toronto, like in VoltDB, all the transactions you can have are local transactions so that you cannot have interactive transactions. It's got to be a stored procedure. We have different uh, ways of writing stored procedures. It's uh, Lua, it's uh, C and C++, it's Swift, it's Rust. So you can you know load any kind of storage procedure in here. It runs a transaction. The transaction gets the exclusive control over entire data set that's in this node, and it gets its work done. Writes to the write ahead log, and uh, then it bounces back and back, and there is okay sent to the client. So if you look at this picture, and uh, you will see that uh, 
uh, the write ahead log is also responsible for a synchronous and synchronous replication in Toronto. And this is the reason number one why we chose uh, not to use RocksDB because the RocksDB has its own write ahead log. Yes, you can turn it off, but I will uh, uh, look at this a bit later. It's not possible to really turn it off and uh, have uh, secondary keys the way we want to have them. So one reason for us to, so, so basically, if you look at this picture already, you will see that uh, in our actor-based architecture, there can be a lot of gains if you just implement the storage engine from scratch just by uh, doing it in actor-based model. So for example, continue processing transactions in a single thread without any locks at all, and uh, offload the work like in lock structured merge trees, it's uh, compaction and dumps to, to, to auxiliary threads, and uh, uh, make sure that we have a single write-ahead log for everything, uh, because uh, we, do it, we do it for replication and engine recovery. And you will also see uh, something, something else on this picture, like we have multiple engines, and the engine itself is not responsible for transaction control. So actually, you need to get me started on engines, but uh, I mean, uh, it, it, the, the whole story of engines, storage engine architecture and all this thing, it was invented in 2005 when Oracle bought InnoDB. So that's the story of engines. Uh, initially, MySQL had this MyISOM engine, then there was Gemini, InnoDB, and nobody would call them pluggable engines before, and before this acquisition. So when Oracle got InnoDB, then there was suddenly appeared a, a whole bunch of new engines like uh, 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 like Black Hole, which is a dev null engine, uh, like CSV, like some strange strange engines which you know would be useful in some corner cases. And if you look at the storage engine architecture as such, at the layers, uh, most of the uh, embedded databases like Wired Tiger, they have their own transaction control, they have their own write-ahead logging. And in a highly integrated database, you actually want to do it differently. You want to make sure that transaction control is common for all engines. Just as an example, uh, in MySQL, with multiple storage engine architecture, they do group, uh, they do two-phase commit and group commit uh, just because the transaction uh, has, a, they have to synchronize different write-ahead logs between each other. If you have a single write-ahead log, you, need to, you do not need to have a group commit only because your transaction touches a couple of engines. So my point and claim is that the number one reason to use, to implement this uh, the way we did it, is that the whole storage engine architecture is, uh, you know, is a legacy thing and the storage engines do not exist. It is a user concept and is embedded in the in, in useful way to just uh, separate the work between teams, you know, there is this engine team and there is somebody else. And uh, some gains are to be, uh, 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 are, there could be gains by not doing it this way. So uh, next, next I would like to get to the details and before I do that I'd like to repeat some more people are in the room. So who doesn't know how log structured merge trees work in this room? Okay. I'm not going to count you, Tyler. So who doesn't know how log structured merge trees work? Again, just last, because I'm going to check now, you know? And if you don't know, you, you, I mean, you're going to, I'm, I'm teaching at a university, so if you, if you don't pass this test, I will, I will give you C's, you know? So, so let me just give you some, uh, let me give you some tests. So uh, this is a, these are pictures I prepared to explain how this all works. But uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you guys all know uh, uh, how log structured merge trees work. And tell me, uh, why are they good for flash? Who can tell me why log structured merge trees are good for flash? Yeah? Yeah, they change, the random writes are changed to sequential writes. Uh, okay. But if there are lots of writes, it's not just the, the writes that it's, they are changing. So, so why are they particularly good for flash? Uh, what about the reads? They are doing a lot of more reads than, than writes. Yeah. There are so, some reads that can be very slow and very slow. Yeah, so, so writes wear out flash, but reads do not wear out flash. 
So uh, reads are essentially cheaper on Flash and from the wear out point of view. So it makes sense to sacrifice read performance for write performance because writes are more expensive on Flash. And then, then, then okay, the second check question is why, why are they good for rotate? So would, be, would that be an invalid argument for like old school disk, like hard drives? I mean, are log structured merge trees better than B trees for hard drives? If so, why? So are they better or not? For for just not not for flash for like old old school hard drives, are they better? Um, maybe better because of sequential writes. Again, sequential <laughs> sequential writes. Yeah. So anyway, and uh, yeah. Better because they don't use that space where they are stored. Page level I/O. Yeah. Yeah. Blocking. What about level of yeah, the underlying Yeah, so we have a quite advanced uh, audience here. So everybody knows already what log structure. So, so they are actually, so B trees. What about B trees and compression? So how do log structured merge trees play with compressions and uh, compare to B trees? What is the problem with B trees and compression? Yeah, these are small pages for compressions. Pages are half full. You have to, all, to go into all of the troubles to fit uh, the stuff into a page, you know. So, 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 okay. And another check question. Anybody knows why it's a binary logarithm here? Is it a bullshit number or is it like a number I made up? Or why is it binary? Why is it not, I don't know, why not B or something? Yeah, you have to do binary search. Does anybody, anybody, like, does RocksDB do binary search? Yes, it does? Well, I don't know RocksDB that well, so maybe it does. Okay, so. Okay, let's go, let's, let's assume that everybody here now understands, after this, uh, this silly questions from me, everybody here understands what, uh, uh, why they are better, and, uh, hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, there is this uh, room conjecture, many of you have heard about it, and it basically claims that you cannot create a perfect data structure. Your data structure has to be either read or write optimized, or it doesn't have to, it, it has to be not online. So you have to sacrifice something, either ingestion speed or read speed or online, online features of your index. So this is just to say that uh, log structured merge trees are not the perfect structure for any for everything. And it's uh, so when we chose it, uh, for us it is a very simple, uh, simple thing because we have a memory uh, database and it's good for everything, you know, high performance. And uh, uh, log structured merge trees are cold store. So it's mostly write intensive, not read intensive because we expect our users to stuff to store the, the hot stuff in memory. So, um, uh, before I go on and uh, just, I would like to define the problem. Uh, when we decided uh, that uh, we want to create our own engine because we, we have all of these features, actor model, our own write ahead log and stuff like that, we, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, so, well, great question. And uh, for in-memory technology, uh, memory access is very fast. So your disk-based database is going to be I.O. bound. Memory-based database is going to be CPU bound 100%. So uh, if you can cut corners on CPU, uh, then, uh, basically, then you win. If you look at the memory architecture of modern databases like Hackathon or MemSQL, MemSQL is uh, built around concurrent skip lists. Uh, concurrent skip lists, anybody knows what concurrent skip lists are? These are like search, search trees which, uh, which play well with multi-threaded access and uh, uh, they're log-free. Well, log, they're not, 
they are they're mutex free, so they're not they're not explicit latches, but they use interlocked instructions of the CPU. Yeah, so it's multi-threaded using interlocked instructions. And uh, uh, well, it's a great great stuff, but if you if you if you are into interlocked instructions into these concurrent data structures, you learn that they scale, but they don't scale infinitely. So there are various techniques to scale, uh, but uh, uh, basically scalability is an enemy of communication. The more scalable you want to make a thing, you need to reduce the communication to a minimum. You need to route your communication through some... So I have actually a separate talk about this, about how to build an in-memory database. It's, and there is a series of articles on my blog, just go read it. There are four articles about in-memory databases and why to use actor-based architecture. So the idea of actor-based architecture for in-memory is that you don't, your transaction processor is log-free. There are no latches, no logs, no, no nothing. And uh, if you compare this, for example, with MimeSQL, who is doing this concurrent skip list. Concurrent skip lists are good for uh, you know, search trees, but if you want to implement a concurrent spatial tree or a concurrent hash or any kind of data structure that, uh, you know, you advanced data structures for you know, geospatial data or anything, then uh, concurrent algorithms do not exist for this. So the only way to do it, to, to, so Toronto in its design chose to, since we need to shard anyway nowadays, everything is horizontally scalable, we begin by sharding uh, on CPU cores. Every Toronto instance is attached to a CPU core and uh, you just shard from the beginning. You run multiple instances on a single machine. So once we got there, Actors became became necessity because once you have a single thread, you can use you know coroutines, you can use uh, callbacks. If you use callbacks, it's a spaghetti, uh, and so on. So so we decided we settled on actors. And uh, yeah, so you got me off track, and I will get back to, to this. Yeah, thanks. So uh, uh, by the way, it's okay to ask questions just as I go. It's it's fun. It's more fun this way. Uh, so, so these are the key challenges, and I, w I would like to ask whether I need to define these challenges if for this group. This, these are the key challenges when you're implementing a log structured merge tree for OLTP database. And uh, I just want to check whether this, uh, whether everybody here understands what is uh, space amplification, for example. So write amplification is kind of obvious. You write more than, is your, when, than your data footprint is. Read amplification is like you read more than you need, right? But what is space amplification? Where, where does one get space amplification from? Please, help me. Huh? Extra files, yeah, so extra files, actually, yeah, I mean, uh, but uh, so, so the files you create while, while you are compacting, these, these are the files you mean, right? Yeah, so, so if you go back to this picture, basically, the naive picture of a log structure tree, when I compact these levels, I need to create a file which is this big, right? And while I'm creating this file, I need to keep the old files around. This is where the space amplification is coming from. And, uh, but there are other sources, right? So other sources are old versions, because you store more stuff in the tree than you, you actually have. You store old versions, you store deletes, and, and stuff like that. So this is the second source of space amplification. Third source is... Uh, mm, uh, your read views. So this is this is present in all actually all databases. Uh, you you maintain data just because you have cursors open against that data. So that would be the third source. So space amplification. Going back to the challenges. Uh, uh, but actually, I would claim that the hardest problem is beyond balancing all this because you need to balance read and write amplifications and uh, the hardest problem is latency spikes so and let me explain this by just uh, giving a naive way of implementing the log structured merge tree uh, yeah let's look at this so uh, so typically 
you have an in memory level, and I'm going to use the academic uh, way to, to refer to this. So this is level no, level z level zero for me, and this is level one, and this is level two. Okay. In most cases, in memory, like uh, Mark Callahan, when he speaks, he says that level zero is this. I'm going to say level zero is this. So this is level one. So when you dump, actually, uh, the challenges uh, the challenges are this. So when you dump uh, when you have this in memory level, which you need to dump, uh, you might run out of memory for the duration of the dump. Because new inserts, new updates are coming in, and they need to land somewhere. So you need to dump in an anticipatory fashion, right? You need to predict how much memory you're going to need while you're dumping. So th this is the challenge now, number one. If you don't solve it, your latency suck, sucks. Another reason why, why your latency might, might, might be bad is that uh, actually uh, you need to, while you're dumping things, you need to uh, access them concurrently. So there is, a, there is a memory level which is in sort of being dumped. There is a memory level which is being used for new inserts. And then, then there is a read. So this read has to access this memory level, which is being dumped concurrently with the write iterator, which is writing it to disk, which is pushing it out. So this uh, concurrency is another ch in another uh, source of latency. Um, uh, finally, even if you if you know what to do with with the dumps, it might you might end up uh, so because of the write amplification, you might have time to dump things but not have time to compact things. So you need some sort of back pressure from compaction to make sure that uh, uh, you don't accept more records than you can compact. So this is, if you don't calculate this, this is the third source of, of latency. So I claim that, to, to resume, I claim that the latency is the hardest, the hardest thing to deal with in a, in a log-structured memory tree. And since we are single-threaded, we have it. Uh, we are in a bit more difficult situation because we that cannot do anything expensive in this in this single thread. We can only accept transactions and uh, insert in the level level zero, and that's it. We all the dumps are offloaded to a separate thread. So this is a quick uh, way of uh, describing how we actually do reads, and uh, you can see that I think I should skip it for for this uh, for this. Uh, group because it's kind of obvious right so how we do reads is it so you read from many levels and you 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 read optimistically and this thing should i explain this or we, we just skip we can just skip to the yeah so so one thing about uh, about uh, this which is different uh, is that you can see that there are uncommitted changes here right and uh, you can see that there is a cache here so uh, the reads are optimistic uh, in the sense that as soon as we get something from this level, we can stop it. Not go to, don't, we don't need to go further. And uh, this is not always true for all levels. But generally, the log structured merge tree is 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 built in a way that as soon as you found something, you you are done, right? So point selects are optimistic. Range selects are less so. But the way we built our tuple cache, which is a, so another difference between us and RocksDB. RocksDB has a page cache, and we have, have a, a row cache. And in our row cache, we support uh, ranges. So even range queries can, uh, can retrieve uh, ranges entirely from our tuple cache. This is a separate, there is a separate challenge in, in doing this in multi-version environment, because you have to maintain multiple versions of ranges. So, so, but I will not get to this yet. So, um, uh, once you've, you've solved some of the basic problems, like you've solved the dump problem, uh, you have this uh, nice tree and you, you dump concurrently with your inserts, you read concurrently with your dump and, and everything like that, you, you still have the problem of read amplification because you, when you do reads, even point reads, you need to do binary search on all levels. So the the way we uh, there is nothing uh, nothing unique that we did there. Uh, 
we have a page index. So pages in uh, in vinyl are variable size. You can define the size, the approximate size of the page, like eight kilobytes, but it doesn't have to be eight kilobytes. It's just you know roughly eight kilobytes because we uh, we compress stuff. So there's a page index to help us uh, find things. And the, the page index contains mean key of every page on, of every run on disk. So speaking of terminology, this is memory level, this is a sorted run, this is another sorted run. And uh, every run has a page, has a page uh, is represented in the page index. So when we actually need to look things up, uh, and we, uh, we cannot use the Bloom filter because this is not a negative search kind of thing. Everybody knows what the Bloom filter is? Yeah? Well, I'm sure you do. So, uh, Vlad, I'm sure you do. So, uh, so we, can, we, we can use the page index and it's not a binary search. It's a search, it's a, it's a binary, it's a search in the page index, which is in, in memory B3. So it's a log B search in memory. Then we fetch the exact page. But still there can be a lot of pages because there are a lot of runs. And uh, uh, the, uh, in, in vinyl there are more runs than uh, on average because uh, our implementation of runs is actually pretty naive. We don't have these blocks like in uh, LevelDB or RocksDB. LevelDB has uh, files which are 64 meg size each. We don't have this. Each run is a, is a file, is a sorted file. But the one difference that we have is that uh, multiple, so every level can have multiple runs on it. We do not start compaction just because, uh, so uh, just because we have too many levels basically. Okay, so we start compaction. So every level can have multiple runs when we compact, we can compact multiple levels, so we can choose to compact these, these files and get, get a single sorted file. Or we can choose to compact everything. But actually when we compact, we, um, mm, when we compact the, the lower level is, the more upper levels we include. We usually include everything in compaction when we compact the, so we call it a major compaction. Everybody calls it a major compaction, not just us. Uh, so, so we include everything from the bottom to the top when we do compact. So, so that, yeah, I'm going to talk about this. So I'm going to talk about this, the scheduler. Uh, so this is a pretty standard. Our difference is that we can have multiple runs per, per level and we can compact stuff on all levels. Uh, and uh, now we get to this naive implementation uh, problem that uh, when you compact and your runs are very big, you create a temporary file which is huge. So to deal with this, we actually, mm, mm, uh, we, we have this logical partitioning of data, which we call ranges. A range is, a, is something that creates, a, 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 which is essentially virtual. It's, a, it's simply saying that, uh, hey, this is a separate tree for, for for, for this case. So when we have too many keys, we split an existing tree into multiple trees and maintain each, each independent tree as a separate one. So this allows us to compact the separate trees independently. And when you actually get into this, you have uh, the problem of uh, uh, your operations on the file system create, uh, they, they do, um, they cannot be atomic, essentially. So you create too many files, you delete obsolete too many files in a single operation, you need to do it transactionally. So this is why we maintain a transactional log of all the file system operations in a separate file. We checkpoint that file, we maintain multiple copies of this file. So this allows us to maintain all the metadata operations, uh, information about the files in, this, in a separate place. And this is actually what makes it possible uh, to make this thing, this whole thing with range is very flexible. So creation of a range is an operation in the method, in, on the metadata, it doesn't affect the data. So, so the ranges, so, so, so what are the advantages of ranges? First of all, we deal with the space amplification because we never compact an entire, entire level altogether. 
we can compact just the default range size is one gigabyte, so we compact on one gigabyte of da data. Uh, another thing is that it's concurrent compaction. Con compaction can run con concurrently with dumps, so we can compact uh, one range and then we dump another one. But there is also a challenge. You see that these lines which separate uh, ranges, they don't go all the way up. The ranges do not exist in memory and they don't exist on level, z level one. Uh, and the reason they don't exist in memory and in level one is that we uh, mm, uh, is uh, is the secondary keys actually. So, and this is another difference between our implementation and RocksDB. In RocksDB, your sec secondary keys are se separate collection. And uh, now I will get to the write ahead login thing again. So, a separate coll by the way, if anybody stopped following. <laughs> Then you need to raise, raise, raise your hand again so, so that we actually get back on track. So uh, secondary keys in memory uh, in RocksDB would typically uh, you know, take as much space as is necessary to dump them on disk in the future. Secondary keys in vinyl, uh, in memory they don't essentially exist. There is an area, memory area which is indexed by a primary key, by a secondary key, and when, they, when we dump things, we dump this entire area, right? And when we dump it, we already create uh, files for various indexes on disk. When we create these files, they don't take into account ranges. It's just a file for, for the entire, uh, we call this infinite range, the range from minus infinitum, infinitum to, to plus infinitum. Uh, so this is this, like, uh, this, this is a typical range like that. This is another one. So it's, it spans the entire range of data. And essentially when we dump such a thing, a range references this, this, this thing. So for references, referencing uh, files without logically including them, we have a concept called slice. A slice, a slice is, a, is, a, is a essentially a reference to a subset of a file. And since we have this uh, transactional log for all the changes, uh, we can maintain these uh, logical concepts in this log only. So this is what allows us to uh, make sure, like for example, we dump things, we dump this uh, run, we create this run, and it's being referenced by as many ranges as it affects immediately. When compaction happens, this reference goes away, and compaction happens independently uh, of on every range. And uh, uh, another good thing about slices is that when, for example, we need to split a range, we don't physically split all the files which are in, which are in the old range. We just create new slices and put them in the new ranges, and this is a logical operation as well. When we need to coalesce two ranges into one, again, we just remove old slices and create new slices and put them into this logical thing again. So this is our way to some to like have a user level file system to manage these files. Uh, so this is about the space amplification. This is all I had to say about space amplification. Yeah. How, how do you use uh, a partition uh, segment? Where, so where do you introduce the independent and both No, no, partitioning is happening for every index independently. So on this level, we don't have separation. Here already we have, uh, it's a different index, but it's not split into ranges. And here it's already split into ranges. So if you have a, a table with two keys, on this level you're going to have a single object, on this level you're going to have two objects, and on this level you can have two by the number of ranges objects. But it's all logical, you know, so it's uh, referencing, is, is doing using the metadata log. So for example, this, uh, this file, it has a single run and a single slice for it because it's already sitting in the range. This file has a single run and but a couple of slices, referenced by two ranges. Index? The index is for a run. A run is a file. The, the page index exists for an entire file. Or, or, you, or I don't get your question. Yeah, so the topology is, the topology is this. In, 
The logical model is this. Index, uh, so tables are built from indexes. Indexes are built from ranges. Uh, ranges are built, built from slices. And runs are just files. They are, they are concept of the, of the physical concept. They, they don't exist in the logical model. So index, range, slice. Yeah. No, it contains, uh, it might contain multiple slices. Range, a range contains uh, as many uh, slices as, as there are levels in the range. So a range essentially is a small log structured merge tree entirely. It contains many, many, many levels. And every level is a slice. And this the slice is referencing a run. So this kind of, yeah, it's a difficult terminology, but the, the main idea is that uh, we, uh, we deal with the space amplification in a different, in a different way. Not, so the advantage of this approach is, well, first of all, we didn't like so many file descriptors, to be honest. We wanted it to be a little less than that. And uh, second, uh, we are looking to, to stitching. We're looking forward to stitching. We don't have stitching yet. Uh, does anybody know what the stitching concept is in, in log structure trees? So stitching allows you to, for, for, uh, for time series data, for example, you normally do not need to, re to merge the levels just to, 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 uh, to compact stuff. Because uh, data that you have on an upper level does not, does not intersect, the range does not intersect with the data on the lower level. So what you want to do is just uh, stitch these files together in a logical in a logical thing without rewriting the files. So this is what called stitching. So this is why we created this, because for example, in RocksDB you can take an entire block to a lower level without rewriting the block. That's good, but this the block boundaries do not always intersect with the pay, with the logical boundaries with the key boundaries. So if you cannot take the block, you have to rewrite the block. So stitching allows you to actually deal with that. And our slices are the way to do stitching. So, so and I said something about this already. So level zero and the uh, tuple cache is just our memory technology. They don't have these collections. And uh, when we first implemented this and we didn't uh, have the, uh, we started dumping things. It's, 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 it, it was a funny experience, a database that doesn't restart. Works well, but doesn't restart. So uh, you dump. So the secondary keys are a little bit difficult without uh, a com uh, with the common write ahead log because you do not log in the write ahead log of the engine the changes to secondary keys. The write ahead log of the database contains only changes to the primary key, the operations themselves, right? And when you recover that, uh, you have to discover that uh, your secondary key file contains data which is probably not in your primary key file. And you cannot delete this data because you probably lost the original, well, original, original row during compaction of the primary key, say. Does this make sense to anyone? No, this is already too, too esoteric, right? Okay, so let's skip this. So, so the reason we have this architecture, it's actually there is no other way to do this in short. There is no other way to do secondary keys if you want to have the single secondary key in memory and you, have a, you want to have a single write ahead log than to dump your entire memory level altogether for all keys. So these are the, the advantages of our approach to implement uh, uh, secondary keys. And uh, I know that RocksDB has something like that, is that uh, uh, Mm, replacing the secondary key, which is caused by replacing the primary key, doesn't uh, go all the way down. It's, uh, it's possible to merge two replaces together on an intermediate level and uh, remove both of them. Something like that. Uh, Mark was explaining this to me, and we have, a, we, have a, uh, uh, we have an alternative way of doing this. So when we replace in the secondary key, we just leave garbage around, and we deal with this garbage on reads. So this way we are able to insert into non-unique secondary keys without reading the old value of the primary key saving on reads. So all of your advantages of the, you know, in, when, you have a sec, when you have a classical 
OLTP, MySQL style workload with secondary keys, all the advantages of write, write uh, optimized engines go away because uh, you have to do reads on every write anyway. Just to check unique constraints, check, check foreign key constraints, you have to do, do, do the read. So it was extremely important to us to make sure that uh, whenever it is possible, we do not do read on writes, even in presence of secondary keys. So now to the uh, sort of central concept of uh, this whole uh, construction. It's the scheduler. Uh, uh, yeah, the problems we've discussed already with the scheduler are compression, uh, I'm sorry, are, are dealing with the latency, dealing with the back pressure, uh, managing the bandwidth, and uh, uh, our concept of ranges made it a little bit easier because we can schedule different ranges independently. The priority of a range in this case of a scheduler is based on the, how many levels it has, this range, and how many reads are to these levels. So for example, if you are not reading the data you are writing, you are not going to compact this stuff. You're not going to need this compaction. So there, there are actually only two reasons for compaction. Reducing read amplification and reducing space amplification. Uh, so if your space amplification is within limits, you don't have to do compaction. So this is what is uh, what is sets the priority for compact and dumps always trump compaction. So the reason, uh, so this is actually, took us some time to figure this out, what are the priorities. So the priority of the dump uh, trumps the priority of compaction whenever it is uh, uh, necessary, but in this case you can end up, end up with too many dumps, right? And you don't have time to compact because you're dumping all the time. So to deal with this, we have a back pressure mechanism from compaction which, uh, which uh, throttles the ingestion speed into the database. So these are the dumps. Compaction is measuring the bandwidth and the total write amplification. There is a bandwidth histogram and we, take, we assume that there is like 90%. We have to make, we have, to have time uh, to dump, so we need to maintain some spare memory, so we do anticipate redump uh, when we say are 70% full. So to know what is the 70% or 80%, we have this, this link. And another thing is when we just simply have too many writes and we have this, this link to, to, to throttle inserts when uh, there are simply too many writes and we cannot cope with compaction. And by the way, this is also a pretty easy thing for us to do. Because of the highly integrated environment, we simply inject sleeps into our scheduler, the actor scheduler already, so all the actors starts to be to move to play a little bit slower when when there is this back pressure. Uh, and uh, another another thing actually I wanted to mention uh, that we had to do probably not present in concurrent uh, you know structures like RogsDB is that we cannot afford deleting deleting dump tuples, dump throws one by one. So we had to implement, uh, we call it log structured memory allocator, when we can collect uh, an entire chunk of memory just because we know that all of the log, log sequence numbers for this chunk are already on disk. So it's append only, uh, append only data structure, you append to the tail and you garbage collect from the, from the head. Yeah. So, uh, so old data is in the head of the data structure. New data is appended to the tail. New data is likely to have newer log sequence numbers anyway. And uh, this is actually, uh, when you think of it, uh, like wh what is, wh how should you distribute your uh, memory between uh, your tables? So RocksDB doesn't have this problem because RocksDB doesn't have the concept of tables, right? So, but in case of, uh, uh, you know, multi-table, so it does, just doesn't, doesn't have the concept, so it does, doesn't mean it's, it just works somehow. So for us it was a question, since you, you're like a, a database with multiple tables, maybe you should dump some tables more often and uh, others less often, just to make sure that, you know, hot tables get more memory. So we figured that your ideal strategy is to dump data in strict log, least recently used manner, LRU. So this uh, automatically gives more memory to hot tables and less memory to 
uh, call tables. So essentially, you dump everything in strict, uh, not LRU, V4. In strict V4, and if you have more data in hot tables, they just uh, going to receive more data until it's their turn again to dump. Uh, the uh, the the more memory you so uh, the longer you can postpone the dump of a hot table, the more squashing you can do in the in memory. So the less you dump actually, because on the hot table you are most likely to be updating the same keys again and again, and you are going to squash these updates into the same statement already in memory before the dump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So a short mention of the transactions. I will skip this. Uh, transaction manager, as I said, is a common thing for all engines in Toronto. So the engine is not bothered with that. Replication backup. We spend a lot of time uh, making sure I can write this. And since it's append only, essentially, you just uh, for backup, you just grab the files. For replication, we have automatic uh, provisioning of replicas. So you, to provision a replica, you need the files. Uh, so we don't take a logical, log, logical read view on the data. We, we take a physical read view on the files and send them to the slave during, during provisioning. Uh, these are the limitations. Uh, I'm not going to actually... Uh, well, they're all self-evident. And uh, this is something I want to uh, look at briefly before I go to the last slide. Of, like, why did we, why, what is the paramount reason for us? I mean, what is the use case? Because, I mean, without the use case, it's, it's useless to create all of these constructions and write all this code. We spent, like, uh, a team of uh, five people spent a year finishing up something a person was writing before that for a few years already. So. So, so this, these are, so this is something I want to talk about. You, uh, I hate configuration parameters personally, and these configuration parameters, I'm going to ditch half of them in the future. So, this one is uh, Bloom false positive rate is how many Bloom false positives you can afford. Uh, page size and range size, I'm going to ditch because I want to have just, uh, I'm going to tune it automatically. This define how many levels you have eventually. And I asked, uh, yesterday on RocksDB BOF, I asked Mark, like, what is your ratio between levels? And he's saying 10. I'm asking, why 10? Why not 8 or 20? And he said, we measured and it's 10. Okay, okay we measured and it's 3.5. Okay, so for our case, it's 3.5, and but we have run count per level, so effectively it's 7 for us and 10 for RocksDB. I don't know, I mean, so it's, it's, it's a question to me. This is the reason I want to kill all of these variables. So, so these are probably self-evident, uh, cache size, level zero size, and thread count. So the actual case, the initial case, why we created an integrated thing is, uh, was that we have this uh, project within the company I'm working for, which is called uh, eternal cookie so we want to keep all the sessions of all the users forever and we don't want to spend a lot of money on this so we want to keep them in a cold store so usually we keep the cookie in a, in memory database because you know it's something that gets updated all the time but if a user is not being you know it's not signed signed up uh, for a while then we need to do something thanks so we created the cold store for cookies and cookies most of the workload for cookie for for like the sessions is update access time. You do nothing. You just you know click a few a few things, and you need to update access, just a few fields of a, of a row. So these updates they actually generate most of the the most intensive write workload that you can imagine. And uh, we created a special statement for updates which are non-reading updates. So you like insert or update essentially. If the tuple does not exist, create a new one. If it does exist, update it and set the new fields to the new values. So this integrated semantics is what makes log structured merge trees work, actually. So this is why RocksDB is so good, that because you can write programs for RocksDB that do not do reads. If you begin using MyRocks, 
it's already almost everything is doing reads because SQL in its semantics is like with all of these constraints, it requires a read. So we created this thing and we started it. It was uh, six months ago when we had the first prototype and it would eat all of the memory and crash. And we would, why would that happen? So why would that be? I mean, it was such a, such a nice design and everything. It can, can, be broken, can break. It turned out that uh, there are some very hot uh, sessions. They accumulate hundreds of thousands of updates over a day. But there are some very, so there is a long tail of cold sessions and there is a, you know, there are a few very hot sessions. So when you're reading this data, you actually need to squash the data as you read. So when you, when you read this, uh, so when you're doing a select and you're selecting a key which has 100,000 updates against it, you need to calculate these updates on the fly. And this, the, the problem was caused by these reads. Uh, the reads of, uh, you know, relatively cold keys were okay because they weren't doing much of, much of the computation. And the reads of the hot keys would have to, you know, squash all of the updates into a single tuple on the fly. And that would take all of the memory. So uh, we fixed that and uh, we are actually watching the amount of, uh, amount of operations. Uh, log structured merge tree contains operations, not values, against the same key. And uh, we avoid having this situation. So the project is now running so and we are going to release a gamma of this as I go back to Moscow from here. So gamma is better, we call it better because it's better than nothing, but gamma is something. So try this out and thanks. <laughs>